future. Hospitality. Hospitality. Sustainability. Sustainability. Innovation. Awareness. We have to keep our emissions now. vitally important to the future of humanity and there is no magic solution and we have to work together in order to deal with it. Shifting is all about bringing an international community together to exchange on topics of sustainability and innovation. Throughout this three-day event, experts from all around the world will share their input and discuss the importance of moving forward to a more sustainable planet. At La Roche, we are committed to foster change for future generations. And we look forward to welcoming you on board. Shifting, where innovation meets sustainability. I'd like to welcome you all to this round table this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ruth Poor and I'm the Head of Teaching and Learning Development at Le Roche. I will be moderating this round table and it gives me so much pleasure to meet all these exciting participants this afternoon. We will have Professor Jeffrey Lippmann, who is co-founder of the SunX program and president of the International Coalition of Tourism Partners. He's the former Assistant Secretary General of the UN World Trade Organization and first President of the World Travel and Tourism Council. We also have Elaine France, founder of Flow in Action, who believes that we can bring about change one mind at a time through creativity, innovation and design for flourishing. Also, Karina O'Gorman is joining us. She's Director of Corporate Responsibility at the Intercontinental Hotels Group. She has three roles that she plays, very important roles at global and regional level. So we look forward to hearing her perspectives. Professor Veronique Bunion is co-founder and CEO of Clearly Energy and comes to us from John Hopkins University. She is a self-proclaimed composter and an energy nerd. <laughs> Then we have Andrew Charlton, Managing Director of Aviation Advocacy, a consulting firm specialized in the aviation industry. And Francine Jeanne Morion from the Verbier e-bike festival, who's also a business developer for UNICEF Cycling for Children. These panelists will be joined also this afternoon by Christine Demenmeyer, the Managing Director of Le Roche Worldwide, and Jocelyn Favre, the Director of Operations for Le Roche, who will participate later in the question and answer session towards the end of our round table. It is with great pleasure that I want to announce here today the launch of the SUNEX Multa Climate Friendly Travel Registry linked to the UN Climate Action Portal. This is another important building block in Malta's commitment to support the travel and tourism sector in the battle against existential climate change. It places our nation in the forefront of transformation for this economically vital sector to become low carbon SDG linked for 2030 and on the Paris 1.5 degree trajectory for 2050. We continue to look forward to working closely with you to charter the way to achieve climate neutrality in the travel and tourism sector by 2050 and to set clear and ambitious annual milestones for meaningful climate action and emission reduction until we achieve that target. While the 2050 target is what the science tells us that we must achieve, 
The journey for all of us to achieve that goal needs to start now. First of all, I would like to thank my friend Jeffrey Liebman and the Sonex organization for helping us to achieve this important goal. We value the partnership and all the efforts towards climate neutral. We believe in collaboration and one important milestone is to share best practices, something that perhaps we were not doing enough in the past. And since last year, we have been doing much more to share knowledge, to share best practices, and also to report on the progress made, which is crucial. Well, I'm pleased today to be part of this panel, uh, this presentation today that talks about a new partnership, a partnership between our region and our association and SunX. Both organizations understand the importance of building climate resilience through sustainable development and climate friendly travel in line with the Paris Accord and the Sustainable Development Goals. There is no greater time and no greater threat to humanity than climate change. I am very proud today, though, to share with all of you and to formally announce the annual Morris Strong Youth Climate Friendly Travel Summit. Hi, I'm Jeff Littman. I'm the president of SunX Malta and I want to welcome you to our Climate Friendly Travel Registry, which we've developed as part of a system to help travel and tourism companies and communities with your plans to reduce your carbon footprint. The registry is simply a tool that helps you to set your goals and to stay on track. It also links individually and collectively into the broader UN system of the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. So we can play our part in bending our trend of carbon emissions and being sustainable and responsible. Last but not least, it will help you to prepare for the evolving regulations that all governments will slowly introduce so that countries can meet their own commitments to carbon reduction under the Paris Climate Agreement. To use the registry, you have to do just two things. First, you have to commit to climate friendly travel. That is low carbon, SDG linked and Paris 1.5 trajectory. And you'll find that commitment in part A of the entry form. It's very simple to complete and everyone has to do it. The second thing is you have to create a long-term carbon reduction and sustainable development plan and then you have to file it on the registry by completing part B. And that will require measurements and projection. We've produced on the registry a simulation of what the entries will look like once it's populated. And you'll be able to see a typical example of a company or a community like your own where it's shown geographically and you'll be able to drill down until you can see the actual plan that they're following. And this is for transparency purposes. You'll be able to access good practice case studies and other helpful support material, which we will be updating on a constant basis. We'll send all registrants a downloadable climate friendly badge that you can use on your own branding material, as well as a copy of the Earth Charter, which Morris Strong pioneered to help us to be good planetary citizens and to make the world a better place for our grandkids. 
Thank you for listening. Okay, we've lost Jeffrey briefly. Jeffrey will hopefully return to us shortly with a presentation he would like to make also. Um, but we will kick off immediately with some of our panelists considering the question of the round table this afternoon. And that is whether our response to COVID-19 can catalyze an initiative for climate friendly um, travel and a new era of climate friendly travel. So I'm going to bring Andrew in immediately because Andrew, the challenges um, for reducing air travel and the, and the challenges generally facing no, the aviation no, no, no. industry are enormous. Can you share yeah. with us your thoughts so in relation to talking. the three types of traveller you identify going forward? The, I, I think there's a number of things, Ruth. Um, the first thing is I don't think COVID changed anything for aviation. It just sped um, everything. I don't know how to deal with this, to be honest with and you. I think those that reserves... means that what we have to do as an industry is go faster and faster towards a yeah. new paradigm. And we've already seen that. Lots of airlines are getting rid of their very old, bigger, multi-engine or four-engine aeroplanes, getting rid of any old aircraft that was much less good, or, or sorry, that was extremely good at emitting, that was a, a much lower, uh, a, much, a much lower environmentally um, sound aeroplane. The second thing that's happening, I think, and, and I think actually just on that point, that airlines are going to become smaller going forward and they're going to have smaller fleets of smaller aircraft. The second thing that's happened is, and we we sit here this afternoon proving it, that we, we are redefining business travel. And business travel is a really fundamental part of the aviation economic model. We're redefining business travel by having Zoom conferences, having webinars, these sorts of things, which I think is going to change some of the way we do business travel. I don't think we've got rid of business travel forever. The hotel industry need not panic too much. But what I can see happening is that increasingly business travel will, procurement departments of, of companies will, for example, say, of course you can travel. We'll continue to let you travel. You can have one flight a quarter. So I think a lot of those very short trips that we used to do, two, three hours for a five hour meeting, that kind of thing, I think those sorts of trips are now going to be well and truly challenged. I think the third thing that's happening for COVID, or the second thing that's happening in, in business terms, I think in holidays, what we've seen happen now is people realising that they don't need to travel so far. People are, we are building a network now of more regional uh, tourism, regional resorts, some of which, of course, we're approaching by car, which is genuinely bizarre because cars are significantly less safe than, and then, and then I think that we will we will find that a lot of the business or that, that sort of hotel, sorry, tourism stuff redefines itself. And then the final group of travel in, in, in the aviation industry, we say there are three categories of travellers, the business traveller, the, the tourist, and then what's called the VFR traveller, which stands for visiting friends and relatives. Um, speaking as an Australian that has a mother that's not over 90 in Sydney and I live in Geneva, I'm obviously I'm in that crowd. And I, I think for sure I'm going to go home and visit my mother or heaven forfend get there too late. But that kind of that kind of travel will continue. But what I think this means is we're going to see a smaller, more refined aviation industry that's going to have slightly fewer customers who travel less frequently. That's not all bad. In the meantime, I do think it is fair to say that the industry's done a great job in the last little while, and you could argue why it took them so long. Um, to embrace things like sustainable aviation fuel and so forth. And that, there's a bunch of political decisions in that I'm happy to talk about, but I think I've gone on for too long, so I'll stop. There. Okay, okay. Karina, I'd like to bring you in here because Andrew says people travelling less frequently, a definite shift, he predicts, going forward. Now, if to there be is... Fair, to, be fair, Ruth, I, I, to be fair, Ruth, I'm saying people travelling less frequently are probably taking longer trips. Um, what I, I, in effect, I think people on business travel too now will travel like an Australian travels, by which I don't mean you've got to wear a Wallabies jumper and you know sing time a kangaroo down sport, but that, uh, but that we will go and we will make our trips really worthwhile. I think it will be much longer, more intense travel. Okay, so Karina, can can you come in here on this? What does this mean for the hotel sector? So people traveling less, maybe traveling for longer, wanting it to, to bring more value to the travel they they do. What does this mean for you? Yeah, so I think actually um definitely seeing people are be questioning their travel a lot more, looking for that kind of sense of, of purpose. Hold on a second, don't I? Why I should be on YouTube now. Can you hear me? <laughs> there you go. We, you you now, but we don't see you. Sadly, the answer is. 
<laughs> yes, we can. We can. <laughs> okay. I'll stick with Karina for a moment, Jeffrey. I'll come back to you in a moment. <laughs> Oh, this is just, I'm picturing what Christmas is going to be oh. like. It's not <laughs> Hi, Jeffrey. Hi there, Ruth. Everybody. At last, Jeffrey, that's wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> Don't worry, you're with us now. So, Karina, if I can return to you for a moment. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, there's two things we're saying. So one, definitely, obviously, people will be considering if they need to travel as often. I think we've been proving we can do a lot of connections virtually. However, I think we are seeing people wanting that human connection still. So actually, we do anticipate travel will come back. And actually, to Andrew's point, we might see more domestic travel. So again, for the hotel business, it's is having that spread portfolio so you're actually responding to the changing needs a lot of people we were seeing in the short period we were allowed back out for a little bit we saw more people going on domestic short breaks just for that change of scenery rather than perhaps the long haul right now um, so i think it's we're in an unpredictable time of, of predicting what our customers will want so it's being more flexible and more adaptable to that and then specifically sort of on the sustainability side what we have seen from COVID is we've all stopped. We came to a standstill. We watched the world flourish around us when we did that. And so we can no longer say customer or individual human behavior doesn't affect climate change. And I think a lot of people are questioning their life choices and the way they live and looking for that sense of purpose. So as businesses like ours that you know naturally are um, very carbon heavy in the way people are traveling and using our properties and like that, we've got to be thinking you know, forward looking and responding to that change in demand. So I don't think people are going to stop wanting travel. If anything, we probably want to do it a bit more at the moment in the way we can't. But what they're going to be wanting and expecting of us is that we're helping them to, to be able to do it in a more sustainable way. And we need to be responding to that. Um, and there's ways we've already been doing that. And there's there's challenges that will come through from COVID. Um, so looking at reducing our carbon emissions and how we operate. But there's also been some wins because of COVID. A lot of things have been stripped from your hotel room. I mean, a lot of those things perhaps were from the 1970s, 80s that we all assumed you still needed a plastic cup wrapped in plastic. I don't think we do anymore. And this has really also given us that chance to say, actually, let's redefine what customers want from travel, what they expect and, and build it to a more sustainable way. So we can still enjoy travel. You know, we want people to still enjoy that, but we want to also make sure it's done in a, a sustainable way too. Elaine, let me turn to you as Karina talks about this moment of stopping and thinking and this opportunity to take stock and reevaluate what we're doing. This really comes into your area, your focus on, on future thinking and how by stopping and observing and reading the signals, we can make some changes. Can you speak to that and where you see some opportunities in what Karina says? Yes, absolutely. I I think we're in a in a in a fantastic moment of opportunity, um, despite the struggles and, and despite the, the nature of, of what's caused it. Um, in order to understand where we want to be in 10 years and in 20 years and in 30 years, we have to really understand what's happening now. So we call those signals um, of, of change. So taking plastic cups out of hotel rooms, that's a signal of change. The big driver of that change was the pandemic. The big driver of the pandemic was climate change. So, or, and all the asset stripping we're doing of the planet. So I would look at those um, things and the work I do is very much around uh, the parameters that Jeffrey set, which I, I think are fantastic. Um, I would say zero carbon, SDG links and the Paris trajectory are fantastic parameters by which we look to the future and we look from what's happening now and decide how we want those signals to unfold. So what was, you know, the, the industry has said for years, couldn't be taken out of hotel rooms, got taken out overnight. Um, they said we couldn't stop aviation. It stopped overnight. It's now coming back. But we have when you have big shoves, then you see big differences. So the diff, what we need to choose, and this goes to what Jeffrey was saying, and in particular, is we have to design solutions now which are innovative, but look not just at growth again, 
but look at flourishing. So when we look at flourishing, what we're asking is, who am I impacting? Does this hotel help the community around it? Or does it actually impact negatively on the community around it? How, do we, how does this solution look when I plot it out across the whole supply chain? Who's a winner here and who's a loser? And then you I mean, start- Let me just return to you because Elaine's perspective there is very much from the customer perspective and the customer as a decision maker. You talk a lot also about investors and and they're the imperative that's coming from them now also driving change and this notion of drivers. Yeah, so I guess if you think about sort of ESG, so environmental social governance and the expectation that businesses that are looking at their sort of ESG approach as a whole are those that will be more sustainable in the longevity sense as well of being the most successful businesses. And actually, that's the questions that investors are asking. And it was interesting during during what we've been going through the pandemic, those questions didn't go away. We thought maybe they would be sort of the bottom question the investor would be asking. Actually, they've only amplified um, and the pressure and expectation continues to go up from the many ratings agencies and indices that exist in this space. So it, it, and there's a lot of data coming through at the moment around sort of the most successful um, businesses and investments are those with higher ESG scores as well. So there's a lot really pushing that this is the right way to go and then here in the UK with things like um, TCFD so Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures which are asking businesses and your board to think about the impact of climate change on you as a business and how you were with it, it's really a, a sort of pivotal moment I think in the fact that addressing these issues as a business are, are just seen as how you do business now rather than the nice to do on the side and I think that's that's very fortunate probably that we had moved to that position during such a challenging time because I think there would have been worries that some of this agenda may otherwise not have progressed and, and it very much is now which is great to see. I think and that's that very much speaks Jeffrey to what you say about all of the different stakeholders needing to be fully invested here um, that all of these different arms need to be reaching out to get in the same direction. I don't want to contradict myself. That's a really bad thing to do. Andrew, Andrew will do it. Andrew will do it for me. I do think all the stakeholders have to move in the same direction, but I don't think the world truly operates that way. I think the marketplace is messy. The political frameworks are messy. The timeframes that we're talking about for climate resilience and for sustainability are 2050 and 2030. And I think the, there's a massive number of, of institutional impediments from history, different organizations, all moving in the right direction, but most of them not listening to each other, many of them making good statements, but actually the statements are designed to, to delay things rather than to advance things. So I, I'm, as I, say, I don't want to contradict myself, but I think all stakeholders should have a long-term goal. And, and we've defined, for better or for worse, the long-term goal is, is not what we think it is, but what society has determined under the SDGs and an immense amount of, of global work outside the bubble of travel and tourism and the Paris Climate Accord. So if, if we could start with that as the topmost of the vision, the SDGs on the one hand, 2030 time frame, that's uh -huh. a 10 year time frame. Nobody actually makes real plans for 10 years because we look at this COVID, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. So we make a 10 year time frame with the SDGs and the SDGs deal with everything that is green poverty, gender equality, life on land, life underwater. I mean, this is really big stuff. And then the Paris Climate Accord deals with how do we get our carbon down to zero by 2050? That's even a longer time frame. Now, in that, you have a lot of stakeholders with different interests. You have, you have the, the components of travel and tourism, transport, accommodation, travel services, booking, trip advisor, I mean, it's a whole range, and I think that the most we can hope at the top level is those long-term goals. The real action is going to come from the base of the pyramid with individual communities and individual companies setting their own targets. Somebody says it's plastic in hotels, 
if you're by the by the water, it's something to do with water. If you're in the middle of the city, it's a different set of circumstances. And that's why we've taken an approach that says, let's let everybody get into the business of setting a plan around their own version of these two targets, 2030 and 2050. And then I think the stakeholders will move in a kind of market responsive way. What you do in Switzerland, Ruth, is going to be very different from, from what I do here in Belgium. And, okay, and let me turn so I then. See this as, as a global framework, a global principles and long term goals, local bottom of the pyramid actions. Okay, so let me turn then. If Elaine looks at you know the signals and customers noticing and the drivers for change, Karina thinks also about investors. Veronique, I know that you see a strong driver for change as being risk and this acute awareness of risk that perhaps the COVID pandemic, among other things, has brought us. So can you speak to that and zooming right out, what are the big, big factors for you? Um. Yeah, I, oops, sorry. Um, so I'm going to take kind of a really kind of big picture view on this. I mean, I think people are starting to see kind of the day to day impact of climate risks in the way that we didn't five years ago. I think there was a much more sort of what was much more theoretical is now became, becoming much more, you know, relatable, at least maybe not everywhere all the time, but whether it's, you know, glaciers disappearing in the mountains, whether it's fires in California or Australia, whether it's, what do we have, 25 hurricanes now in the Atlantic this season? I think that, of you know, I think we're in the age of climate reality. Um, and I think that's, I think that's true for the vast majority of people now. And so now the question is, well, you know, how do you, how do you translate, you know, how do you get change, right? And so I, I, I try to be an optimist. Um, I think we've actually come an incredible, incredibly long way in the past 10 years, like 10 years ago, I would not have been able to articulate any kind of like, what's the pathway to climate solution. It was just kind of out of, you know, the technological realm that, that we had. It was sort of in the lab, um, but it's not anymore. I think for about two thirds of the emissions that are out there, we don't, we know how to do it. We just have to do it, right? And it's very simple. It means electrify everything and make the electricity clean everywhere. Um, and it, you know, that may seem ambitious, but in most places or in a lot of places or in more and more places like sun and wind are the cheapest forms of electricity. And increasingly we know how to store that. So that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean there's not complexities left. There's plenty, plenty of them, but, but we can start sort of see, see the light. And there's some things we don't know how to do yet, right? We don't know how to do clean air travel, um, you know, because there's problems with hydrogen and there's problems with batteries. Um, and I'm sure Andrew knows a lot more about that than I do. But for, you know, for hospitality, it does mean that hotels have to have clean sources of electricity. Hotels can't have kind of fossil fuel heating systems anymore. That in everybody's planning, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years or whatever life cycle these systems are on, that that has to go. There's sort of no, there's no ifs and buts about that anymore. Um, that means that, you know, hotel fleets or fleets of vehicles have to be all electric. Um, we can do that now. And so, you know, and I think in the future of travel, okay, maybe we can't fly to where we want to go, but if we can drive an electric car to a hotel that's, that's, you know, checked its boxes and it's sort of clean um and by clean it's it's you know no offense to the plastic cups in the plastic wrappers and i thought that was funny but it sort of has to be it's it's you know it's behind it, there a lot of it is behind what you see as as a customer and a traveler right it's it's the systems it's the infrastructure um but but you know Taking your electric car, plugging it in a clean hotel, you are kind of in the future of climate friendly travel. And it's it's very much there, right? And so I'm a firm believer then, that we will as, that as we will figure out aviation as well. As you well, can, so much importance on, electri on, on can, electricity can I, and can I, that we can fly, Andrew, but that when we're there, as Karina says, where we go needs to be incredibly um, sustainable and what we do while we're there needs to be sustainable. Francine, can I bring you in to talk to us about one of the big success stories of this COVID crisis, which is e-bikes, but the 
e-bike festival that you work with predates, in fact, COVID. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? That as a response to climate change and also e-bikes more broadly? Um, yeah, so last year, actually two years ago, um, Nicholas Halewood, who's also the organizer of the Free Ride World Tour, has uh, had the idea to um, set up a new concept and a new event, which is the Verbia e-bike festival, aiming to be the biggest um, e-bike festival in the world, in the mountain, let's say, because he saw uh, the climate change in the mountain and um, winters coming later, uh, being shorter, um, I mean, not for for um, resorts that are high in altitudes, but most of the time for the uh, lower uh, altitude um, um, uh, resorts. So he had the idea to organize that event, uh, bringing a four season tourism in mountain regions, because uh, here in the Valais in Switzerland, we are very much um, uh, focus on the winter tourism and not much was being made and there was not many ideas about what to do in the summer so e-bike is a perfect solution e-bike is the perfect response to to um to the four season tourism because it brings it really aims to the people who are in uh, the mountain in the in the winter that ski and you can really offer them um, the same kind of feelings, the same kind of adventure experience and discovery of the mountain, but in the summer on the trails um, on an e-bike, which is an easier way to get along um, in the mountain. You, because I don't know if some of you have done e uh, mountain bike in mountains, very <laughs> tiring, exhausting. You can't talk, you can't share anything with, with your partners. So an e-bike is another way to like just enjoy the mountain and have fun. So um, last, and so this, Bernie last, also mentioned not just doing things with electricity, but also that electricity being clean. Yes, d d so in, Germany, that, yeah. Yeah, in the Val de Bagne, we have the chance to have a, a company that is called Al Altis. And uh, Altis has um, and puts uh, lots of uh, big chargers in the, in the valley. There is 16 of them. It's a clean, it's a clean uh, electricity in a way that is 100% hydraulic or sonar powered and, and produced locally. And uh, so you go around with your e-bikes and you can plug it in when your, your battery is empty. And um, talking about the e-bike in industry that has been booming like uh, in the last three years, especially, but it's totally amazing because this year we had the problem with the e-bike festival and the COVID. We thought, oh, so first of all, are we going to be able to, to organize the thing? So we took the chance and we said, okay, we're going to do it. It was in August. But the problem was that all the e-bike uh, and the, the industry had been totally bankrupt because not bankrupt, but they've been sold out. Um, all the bikes and even the, the, the um, how do you say, uh, the uh, try, no, oh, all try the bikes bike. had been sold out. Yeah, during the April, May, uh, people just wanted to get out and buy buy bikes, so they just went and they bought the bikes, and so that's why we had problems not in, having enough bikes during the festival. But then, so, Elaine, this must sing to you with your ideas around, you know, what flourishing means rather than growth, um, and also innovating. This must just be music to your ears. <laughs> It, it is, and, and because I live not very far from Francine and, and the e-bike festival is, is very prominent um, uh, to me, it, it's really powerful. What I think about is um, the, the e-bike, e-bikes um, are a signal of what that the industry might look like in the future, what might it look like in this region, what does it, what will happen in, um, uh, in 10 years? But it doesn't solve the problem of climate change and climate action because the glaciers are still melting. So we're replacing um, a season by just joining up seasons to make one big season where there are e-bikes. So there's there's multi layers of 
what do we think in terms of the consequences, but it mustn't prevent us. So it's fantastic about the e-bikes, but it mustn't prevent us from looking also at how we um, resolve climate change and how we continue to plan to undo the damage that is being done. What, what action can we take by being innovative now? And it goes to something Veronique said about risk. If you don't plan now for 10 years out, you won't prevent the future shock that will happen over five, 10, 20 years. We have to look at what's happening now, the signals now in order to prevent the catastrophe further down the line. And that's really essential because we didn't do it. And that's why we have a pandemic and that's why we're in the mess we're in. So it's really important that we join the dots up around risk and future shock. Andrew, let me just turn to you again then. You know. The aviation industry, you've struggled so hard to try and find solutions to do things much cleaner to do. <laughs> what is a potential solution? Is it just reducing the number of people traveling as a result of change in habits in some way instigated by COVID? Is there something bigger? Um, Jeffrey foreshadowed that I'd be the person that contradicted myself. Um, I think that's what he said, or I'd contradict him one or the other. Uh, and there's a lot of points in all this that I'm really struggling with, of course, as the, as the aviation guy in this conversation. Um, Veronique, I think it was Veronique said it, um, we have problems with sustainable aviation fuels. I'm absolutely not a supporter of sustainable aviation fuels because I can't quite see why you you go to another system that's not all that much better than the current system. There are problems with hydrogen, which is sort of the the dream solution at the moment until you realise that hydrogen also emits, it emits water. The trouble is we don't normally have water at 38,000 feet. Uh, there are some really serious issues with, with aviation and we're going to have to, to work on that to, to, to pick up on some of your lane's points. If, if what you're trying to do is undo the damage, then the answer is not fly at all, but to contradict Elaine in a number of ways. Aviation didn't stop during the COVID crisis. Aviation didn't stop at all. And indeed, but for aviation, a whole bunch of PPE wouldn't be in the right place right now. There was huge amounts of cargo shifted around and your e-bikes are going to be just fine unless you try to actually use pieces that come from China and other places like that. So we need to find ways to accept that. We need to acknowledge that there is a need for some aviation and we need to look at the ways we can mitigate the risk, if you like, and mitigate the damage. And, and in real terms, Ruth, there's no question, that means fewer people flying and fewer people flying less often. And to come to, to Jeffrey's point, what is the market solution for that? It's to increase the price of travel, at which point you run into a really interesting problem with what do you do, what is for all of the downside ecologically of aviation, the last 20 years in aviation has been a remarkable democratisation. And so we're stuck trying to balance some societal requirements. And yes, I appreciate democracy. Well, you can look at America, democracy can be a short term thing, but uh, and, and, the, and the ecological problem is forever. But we've still got to find some ways to balance some of those society requirements. Now, if it's increasing the price of of aviation fuel or the flights themselves, that's terrific, but it does price whole sections of the community out of the market. Perhaps the solution is you get one flight for free a year and then up, by which I mean untaxed, and after that you, you have to pay a tax on it. But at the moment, pending a technological breakthrough, the only solution that starts to address Elaine's issues is to stop flying. And I think that that sounds really easy and really simple, but gee, I'd be interested in some of the innovative solutions that the client's got yeah. to sort the But issues. I didn't actually say, Andrew, to stop flying. What I focus on in my work is we look at the signals and we say, what can we do? So actually we're in agreement that some of the technological solutions that you're talking about are impossible. They're certainly impossible now and they're very Star Trek. So you look at what is possible and what is possible in the aviation industry is, as you've said, you've seen a dramatic shift, big signals around business travel that can be built on positively. Then it's about looking with the aviation industry and Carina and the hotel industry and um, and really looking and go, well, what is it that people want? What is people want to see their relatives? I haven't seen mine since last Christmas. And that is really important to me. So how 
of course I have to fly. How can I do that in a way which is positive? Um, the end game is is better. So I'm not I'm not talking naively. So please don't assume that. What is important is that as as players in this table, at this table that we sit down and go, okay, what is possible right now? How do we undo what we can undo by offsetting it with our innovation that is really positive and is about flourishing for everybody involved? It's much later, doesn't Sorry, it? I'd like to bring you in well, here because Ross, very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, Ross, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Can I make a, a comment here? Um, you do. And I don't I don't want, having contradicted myself, I don't want to be disparaging to everybody who's who's on the call. You know, we see such a small figure individually of the very complex framework, for example, that is aviation, the thousands of companies, the, the millions of dollars which is being spent. And I don't want to be an apologist for aviation. I've got a very simple view, which is, a bit different from Andrews. If the aviation sector can be as climate responsive as other sectors, we shouldn't have people who have a limited amount of experience in the dynamics of that sector saying, we want to do this, or we should do that. This is a huge global complex system. Now, I think there are two solutions to aviation in the 2030 and 2050 time frame. This year, Airbus said they will produce by 2035 three new aircraft types. Yes, Andrew, some of it using hydrogen. And Airbus, this massive conglomerate, made a public commitment to that extent. Now, for my money, I'm prepared to go along and say, that's pretty good. If Airbus do that, I've no doubt that Boeing are sitting there saying, we better do the same thing. So if the two big aircraft manufacturers by 2035 produce zero carbon aircraft, as they've announced, nobody should say you shouldn't do that. And that responds to a point that Veronique made that said, well, maybe we shouldn't fly, we can go by car, unless you want to go across the ocean, and then it's pretty difficult to go by car. So one solution is 2035, half the world's aircraft are supposedly going to be climate zero, according to one of the manufacturers. The second half of the solution, yes, biofuels, synthetic fuels, they're not the perfect solution, but they're a they're a temporary solution till we get to 2035. There have been 200,000 plus flights with synthetic fuel, and synthetic fuel reduces dramatically the amount of pollution. So with those two elements, flying can at least come back into the table, and, and I would argue, if it meets my criteria of, of climate-friendly travel, why can you say, you shouldn't fly, but you should still keep doing agriculture or building or other things which use much more carbon in a global planetary sense. Veronique, you're looking skeptical here. <laughs> no, I just like to make faces on, on Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> um, oh man, there's so much to say. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think, so maybe to take a step back, right? The aviation and industry is, is the only sort of global body that has actually set that I'm aware of that has set a an actual target for its own emissions across the board. So um, it's called the Corsia framework. So it's not perfect. I can um, and it's not prescriptive in terms of how we're going to get right. there. Um, so anyway, that's aviation. So aviation, you know, actually, I think you need, we need to give, you know, from the technology side, there's things to figure out, but from sort of a global policy standpoint. They've actually um, done quite quite a bit. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, you know, aviation is two three percent of global emissions. While transport altogether is is more like you know twenty percent. So when you just hear that, hey, there's no there's no e bikes available because they're sold out. There's no bikes. There's not a single bike anywhere in the Western world, right? That can be bought right now, um, and that's amazing, right? So so. That's kind of in terms of emerging out of COVID. That's what people don't 
you know, if you can replace any kind of car travel with with bikes, e-bikes, those are huge gains. They're also gains that, because they're largely in cities, those are gains that make cities healthier, right? Because you're replacing hello, kind hello. Of local emissions with, with, with no emissions. Um, so if anything, I think we need to emerge out of this by building infrastructure to sort of keep people that switch to biking to bikes, right? And, and chip away at, 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 at land-based emissions that way. Um, yeah. Can I bring in, Jeffrey, you had some slides to share with us. This might be a good moment to bring those in and see if that opens things mm -hmm. out further. Do you, you think so? so? I don't want to spoil your discussion by bringing something in which is sort of a little bit micro. I mean, I'm happy to do it, and, and, and I just don't want to be totally disruptive. Okay, I've called this presentation Sticking with the Climate Crisis. Um, and even though the title of the sector of the segment is the COVID crisis. Okay, I just want to position Senex Malta and travel and tourism. Senex Malta is basically a legacy program for my friend and, and, and of 25 years, Maurice Strong, who was the architect of this green swap you see here, which I would argue is a quite progressive, expanding sustainability and climate frame, framework for humanity over 25 years. If you come, I say again, if you come out of the silo of travel and tourism, the, the global community, internationally through the UN, by national governments agreeing all through this pattern from Stockholm to Rio to Kyoto to the MDGs to the SDGs and Paris in 2015 with a vision going forward of 2030 and 2050. The architect of that was Maurice Strong who was the Secretary General of the first Earth Summit in Stockholm in 1972 and of the really big defining summit in Rio in 92. So I set up a not-for-profit which was designed to link that development with the important development of travel and tourism, which in the pre-Rio 92 period didn't feature in any of those discussions. And in the post period has, has, has integrated, I would say, marginally, marginally. Organizations have been doing the main integration, partly the UNWTO since 2000. UNWTO's goal has been to show that tourism should be in, involved in everything and without going too deep into the issues. And IATA, which is the main, um, the main organization, I believe, the most, the most effective organization, has been arguing a totally unambitious target which is half the target that the rest of the world is, is putting in place. Veronique men mentioned Corsia. Corsia, Andrew, in my view, was a sort of managed solution based on a moderate ambition. When the rest of the world is talking about zero carbon 2050, the airlines are talking about half the pollution we did in 2005. And, and everybody knows 2050, Nobody can really make an, a, a proper projection for that. You could at least make a decent, honest stab at it. So in this process, we set up an NGO. About a year and a half ago, we found a relationship with the government of Malta, which is a, an interesting player because Malta put climate change on the agenda of the UN, and Malta is a, is a tourism destination. Look, COVID-19, is dramatic. It's like a stab in the back. It's stopped the world community in its back, in, in its strides. But climate change is, is a little bit different. It's not that stab in the back. It's the frog in the water that gets slowly boiled as the heat comes up. And this just shows the impacts. I don't have to go into them in detail. It's everything, everywhere and it's intensifying. 
none of these bad things, the droughts, the floods, the forest fires, the permafrost which is burning, and the 10 million climate refugees over the last decade, none of that's going to change. In fact, the climate refugees are projected to increase tenfold over the next decade, 100 million climate refugees. And this is why I showed this last, last time. I mean, this is why climate change is so critical, because if we don't bend that red curve to the blue curve, that's what Paris is all about. We're currently on the red curve. It's going to kill our grandkids. So we've got to put stuff on the blue curve. And we've got to do it by 2050. That's a mythical date that they pulled out the air. And to make that change, we've got to start the action now and be quite active between now and 2030. That's what that slide says. And yet, this is, this is what I truly believe, is that um, you see in the bottom slide, that's taken from The Economist. And basically, it says the impact of climate change will be um, like COVID-19 on steroids. And I think we've got to be clever enough as a sector, transport, accommodation, travel services, the whole value chain, which makes up this 10.3% um, of GDP that everybody has been using now, which is the WTTC figure, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to deal with the COVID crisis, and we have to at the same time, do everything that we weren't doing, which is necessary for the climate crisis. And, and we call that climate friendly travel. That name is deliberately chosen because it's the kind of name that we ought to be using on social media. We want people to think about travel in a climate friendly way. And we spend most of our time sort of arguing inside the industry about the very things that people ignore, the details, the stuff that the airlines put out, and the activists, who, who I have an enormous respect for, the Greta Thunberg generation, they say, this is all bullshit. You have to just get in line with what everybody else is doing. And that's what we are trying to do. So we did a report last year with WTTC, and it basically said, you're not doing enough you're talking about doing more than you said you were going to do. And on top of all of this, your ambitions are not strong enough. So we said, look, there's two things out there. I mentioned this earlier. The first thing is there's this mass of sustainable development goals. You know, some people talk about we need to do wildlife tourism. Some people say we need to do eco tourism. It's all in this global framework. And the second thing is, and this is, these are two critical kind of anchors. 2030, I mentioned this before, SDGs, get yourself aligned with the ones which are relevant for you. If you're, a, if you're a, a tourist destination, which is a small island, you're going to worry about SDG 14, life underwater. If you're a Hilton hotel in Brussels, you're not. So you can't say there's a common approach. Each one has got to dig into these to find where what I call its green future. They echo the, the environmental, the pro poor, the conscientious. There's a hundred names for the different types of travel, but they're all somewhere linked to the SDGs. And, and that is that whole movement around green growth. If you can't make your growth green, you don't deserve to have growth. That's the basic line. Instead of just talking about this, we've put in place some tools where people can commit, where they can make a long-term plan, where they can register it. We built a registry, which is linked into the UN Climate Action Portal, a registry for the travel and tourism sector. And by the way, it's boring. It's, it's like a, a big telephone book for the entire sector. But that's what it is when you deal with a response to a complicated issue in a complex world with individual players 
people group together in coalitions to look after their interests. Individually, they have to make plans, they have to link them to 2030, and they have to link them to 2050. And the second thing we did, and where we've had this great link with La Roche and with Jocelyn, is we started a diploma in climate-friendly travel. It's currently operating. It's the first time it's been done in the world. We've got 25 of who I think some of the smartest people in the world, and Andrew, who are going to be lecturing, and um, <laughs> sorry, Andrew. And and we've got 45 smart, bright students from 30 countries. And at the end of this period, they will understand the dynamics of climate and sustainable development in terms of tourism. And they'll go back to their countries. We'll try to find internships for them. If there's anybody on this this call who'd like to get a smart, bright young person. And they will build communities in their country. They'll build 50 climate champions on the, using Instagram and, and, and Twitter and everything else that people use nowadays to communicate. And we will build over 10 years, our plan, a cadre of 100,000 across the UN system, smart, bright, young, Greta Thunberg types who actually think tourism's a good thing if it's clean and green. That's the framework that I talked about. This is the registry. It's built. It links in with the UN Climate Action Portal. We have an agreement with the UN that they will deal with this as the focal point for travel and tourism. And we've hired a couple of people to run the registry and help companies and communities develop their own plans and file them on the registry. You can come in easily for, for with a very simple entry, but in two years, you have to have a plan up there. And we've got a whole framework developed and integrated for that. The second thing is this diploma with the plan to have 100,000 strong champions. And the third thing that we're planning to do, and here, Le Roche should come in, if you can press the next slide, please, is that in April of next year, we will launch an annual strong climate-friendly travel youth summit with the uh, Thompson -Tuck Okanagan Tourism Association in Canada, and we'll make it a virtual a hybrid summit, uh, probably virtual next year, and we'll, we'll try to reach out to the young people to get them to discuss what they think climate-friendly travel should look through. And we've introduced and we will announce some breakthrough awards for young people with Le Roche. Um, and we'll focus on aviation this time around, Andrew. We will get young people to write um, not essays, not typical tourism research, which is, I think, uh, blue sky stuff for the most part. We'll get them to write thoughtful policy papers and we'll on, on, on the two elements that we just discussed, sustainable fuels and the 2035 Airbus initiative. Will it change the game? We call them breakthrough initiatives. And we'll give them some uh, a prize, uh, 1,500 euros, and um, we'll give them entry into our, our diploma course if they want it. So, that's that's the presentation I was going to make at the beginning. And the only point I want to make is I've been around this game a long time. It's one thing to to make statements about what you're going to do in, in 10 years and 20 years time. That's pretty easy. You have to have an institutional framework. Morris Strong built the United Nations Environment Program, the IPCC, these are all creatures of, of, that Morris put in place. The IPCC, the UNFCCC, he chaired two global summits on sustainable development, and he um, created the Kyoto Convention and, and, and the Desertification Convention and a whole host of other things. I think we need to have institutional pieces that can help the individual players, the stakeholders, as they grapple to find their place in that future. And last comment, after the COVID, and it's been said in this, in this discussion, 
we're going to build back better. We all say that. It's, it's nice words. The issue is going to be, will people do that? Or as soon as we get the vaccine and people can start to go back to normal, will the future be dominated by the online travel companies, the low fare airlines, the, I have it in my local airport, you can go to five destinations in Europe from Brussels for less than the price of the taxi to get to the airport. It, which, you know, the young people have a better vision than we ever did. And my belief is that's where we should be putting the focus. And, and lastly, that's why I've been so keen to work with you guys at Le Roche, because that's what you're all about. You're training the next generation of decision makers. Thank you. Turn on my microphone. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. If the others would like to turn on their microphones, is there anything in particular that anyone would like to come in on there? And I'd also like to open up now for questions. If there are any of our um, attendees, anybody joining us with a question, please do share that question so we can place it to our panelists around this round table, please. Ruthie, if I may. Yes. Um, where to start? Uh, first of all, Jeff. Jeff's comment that Airbus is going to re re launch their first hydrogen aeroplane by uh, 2035 does not mean half the flights will be hydrogen at 2035. It means the first of one aeroplane of an incredibly slow process. But much more importantly, that's that's just a technical point. Anyone who believes anything an aircraft manufacturer tells you tells you about their production schedule, uh, I've got a bridge to sell them. Um, just as I've got a bridge to sell Veronique for thinking that Corsia has any value whatsoever, it was created by the industry so as to not put the asset on its hook. But do contact me, Veronique, because I have a lovely bridge you'd love to buy. <laughs> but the more important point in all of this, I mean, I could I could hammer away here for hours. But the important point is both for Jeffrey's. Um, hydrogen aeroplane. The problem is that unless we stop, and I mean that as a as a mandatory stop, unless we stop using the old aeroplanes, we can't bank on a COVID every other year to stop using old aeroplanes. Unless we put a mandatory mandate that old aircraft have to be phased out, no one will have an incentive to buy the new ones. We have to, we allow, because it, we make aircraft too well, they live for 40 years, so we allow old aircraft to continue to operate for 100, well, for dozens of years more than they should. And so we need to have, as a matter of policy, and it's a government thing, this, you, all of you, all of us, all of you need to talk to your regulators and your legislators and make this LAW law, because unless you do that, there's no financial incentive for an airline to upgrade their technologies to this brand new style of aeroplane. And that's similarly- but Governments will do that, Andrew. Governments Sorry, will you. do that. Governments will do that in the same way that they put mandatory limits on cars. You will not be able to buy a, a, a petrol fuel car after 2035, 2030 in Europe, the Green New Deal will put limits on that. And, and I, I agree with your, your basic point, by the way, a, aircraft which, which are not climate friendly should go. That's yes. simple. As, as, should, as should the inefficient un, and unfriendly, climate unfriendly ways we fly in terms of air traffic control. But the point remains, Jeffrey, that we, we're, we're demanding this on cars because people demand it. We need to demand it of, of our aeroplane makers as well. And that is to say, we the passengers need to demand it. And, it's a, yeah. and it becomes a policy. I don't, think that's why, I don't think that's why we're doing it on cars. We're doing it on cars in the same way that Henry Ford offered customers any color they like, so long as it's black. The big players, and I sat in some sessions in, in Davos, in the World Economic Forum, when the big players made a shift and said, yeah, we can put some electric cars in. Then Tesla came along and, and then other people matched it and technology came along and, and governments watched all this and, and their lobbying organizations cut a deal with them. And they, and they produced regulations led by the EU, driven by the EU, and we'll get rid of cars and planes should follow the same routes. Why couldn't they? 
Well, good luck with that. I, I, I agree completely, Jeff. I, I, I think, think it's, and I think this, let's this not has talk been, about aviation yeah. to the exclusion of everything else. Let, I'm happy, Ruth, to stand back and have this conversation again. I think we um, have plenty of examples of, uh, of examples of policy and history that once you see the technology emerge, it becomes so much easier to sort of tighten the policy goals. I, I don't just uh, that for rolling. Yeah, we've seen moment. that with like the ozone hole, the Montreal Protocol. We're seeing that with cars. We'll see it with airplane if it's ten years later. Well, well we hope. it's we not. Live you live know, it's just, it's it's okay. I mean, <laughs> you speak about the this also has. how corporate social responsibility departments would have been an easy thing to cut in a crisis ten years ago, and you're not seeing that in the industry at the moment, are you? No, correct. So I think having been old enough to have been working for quite a few years now, um, I think when there was um, sort of economic crisis before, we were definitely the teams that were first out the door. We were always seen as the adjuncts to, to the way you were running your business. Um, and I think you really are seeing that change. You know, we're sort of critical to the, you know, there's still a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but I think it is really integrated into how businesses are looking at how they need to operate to stay competitive. And, you know, really, there, there were so many drivers for this, that if you want to be a competitive business for the long run, the market is changing around you. Perhaps government legislation doesn't come fast enough to make it regulatory change that's driving up. But there are other pressures that are meaning that businesses can't ignore this anymore. Um, and I think before it was seen as it might help the brand a bit, but actually now it is critical to your operations. And I think that's really important and that helps us do our job better because now we used to be knocking on the door now they come and find us which is a massive shift in actually how do we tackle this and that's testament to, to Jeffrey and others for actually constantly talking about it getting it at that high level of the agenda so it is discussed in Davos and things and maybe that doesn't move things as quickly as we'd like but it's amazing to see how that resonates back into to more boardroom discussions and that's that's definitely the direction we hope to see more of. I'd like to, to just take a different direction and bring it back to to youth. Um, so I've been working for 25 years now and um, been working with youth for at least 10 years in particular and taking them on the journey from setting them a, an SDG based challenge um, that is particularly like climate action based and asking them to basically innovate ideas and it never fails to amaze me how rapidly they get this. So I work with kids from eight to uh, young people up to 35 in particular, um, as well as then in the in the corporate world. But the, the younger the children are, the more um, advanced and innovative their thinking is because they don't think with the rules that we have around territories and politics and and stuff and actually I send their ideas to PhD to to different university departments to use in their to show to their PhD students and the professors are usually so impressed that they then advise their PhD students to have a good look because they're they think in this in in terms of the resilience cycle they think in terms by default in in design thinking they think from a perspective of planet planet centered design is people centered design and that's what's missing from the innovation spaces um in in corporate departments there's always that you know grab for territory whereas yeah. Students at La Roche are thinking in a different way. The students that I work with and, and kids I work with think in the way that they want the world to look in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's really seen that to well. get that, that get back to that. Yeah, yeah we've done innovation camps with students in the last year. Awesome. Yeah. But no, these Karina, kids, Karina no, please go ahead and I'll jump in after. These kids have had Earth Day in their education from the time that they were very young. People like us, me particularly, and, and Andrew a little bit, um, people like us and the corporate decision makers um, that, that uh, Karina was talking about, they were never brought up in this world at all. And, and you know, the NGOs in this world I, they're much more sensitive to this and they understand the power of young people and the issues that we're talking about today it's their world we'll be, I'll be dead uh, many people people here will be no it's true you know you I don't want to be dead but you have to face up to it but you talk 2035 uh, 2030 for the SDGs it's 10 years in the future and 
and young people have a much better grasp of of the green issues than anybody or not anybody but most people in corporate decision making who are sitting around the table now yeah, and if I might just jump on that, Jeffrey, I completely agree with you, but I think one piece that we haven't discussed here, which is also extremely important, is that we also need to teach sustainable management and the economical value in being sustainable, because without this piece, there's no way that sustainability will sustain the journey, actually. And this is really important, and it's a little bit the base of the festival here, that we have to look, and it's right, that we have to go to every single age group. And, you know, for our festival over the last three days, we've been delivering workshops to primary schools and these workshops are all about awareness. And, you know, even at three years old, four years old, five years old, it's awareness. What's going on in the world? Get innovative, cut up paper, make windmills. We did that last year. Um, you know, but I think we have to progress. And at Le Roche, for me, it's really, really important that we also focus on the economical value, because if we miss this piece, we're going to have a lot of people talking. But at the end of the day, we need to have business models behind sustainability that work, because this is how it's going to be pushed forward in the future. And this, for me, is the education and uh, you know and it's important then the last piece is this industry piece where you gather people like us that work with it every day who've seen it who have a history in it to share and discuss ideas and you know we have our audience of students out there listening to us and this is great but they also have a responsibility now and i think this is really the point and we are stronger together and we you know we have to take this collective intelligence and place it properly within the industry and um and that comes back down to business a lot of the time which is sad but true yeah i don't Sorry. think they can go wrong with the with the john elkington who invented the triple bottom line um people planet profit he did a management recall on that in 2018 and he said we need to add in a fourth pillar that fourth pillar is human well-being and when you're when students uh -huh. Students default to the four pillars intuitively. They understand impact and they understand human well-being as part of, you don't get, um, you have to be able to, to meet your needs. So you don't get economic um, certainty unless you are also designing a solution which is a solution which cares for the community, which cares to meet people's needs, which cares for well-being. So I think that's a really important driver of innovation and I work in, in entrepreneurship and youth entrepreneurship and the ideas that get seeded rapidly um, are fantastic. This week is Global Entrepreneurship Week and uh, the, the stuff that's been coming out of Switzerland is phenomenal. And I think what La Roche is doing uh, and this work with Jeffrey is seeding not only the next generation of innovators, but the next generation of business people who are designing businesses in a way which challenges the status quo we've got now and and really makes them the risk takers who will um, design solutions design businesses run their businesses around these four pillars because you can't have you don't get tourism if, if the community around your hotel is dirt poor or less than dirt poor that's not good for business so you have to this is the new dynamic that we are all in um, positions have been switched the vaccination means nothing in reality when it comes to where do you want to go in the world? Elaine, I, I just want to um, add a dimension to that. Um, I've been arguing for some years now that there are, I call it the quadruple bottom line, as distinct from John Elkington's triple bottom line. But I would argue that climate change is a dimension because it's yeah. not a subset of economic, social, or environmental it's a determinant of yes. each of those elements going forward so yeah, I, agree. I have great respect for john elkington i was i'm old enough to have been around when he developed the triple bottom line and, yeah, and if, he thinks, if he thinks that well-being is is one i will shift to a quintuple bottom line yes no i agree yeah the driver is now climate climate change climate action we have to it makes no sense, you know, if, if you can't breathe, and that is very topical this year, and I don't mean that glibly, it is our number one survival need. If you can't hold your breath forever, 
then you know that's it. it we have to breathe clean air is not how um how you breathe it's also what you breathe and this is a collective for, for, for responsibility those, for those of you who haven't really dug into it if you look at the eu's green new deal and this is to your point on the economics it's entirely based on the assumption that a renewables based future will also produce better economics enormous possibilities for new job creation enormous possibilities for new infrastructure development and with biden coming in in the united states with a very similar kind of deal i think there'll be some sort of strategic government drivers which which we should we we should be looking at and taking advantage of the clever companies will gear themselves to take advantage of those those two particular initiatives because there will be the legislation in 10 years time i'd like to come in now and say that we're already way over time but i thought it was really worth continuing this conversation and i would like to draw everyone's attention to the artwork and that we can see on the screen that Vera and Marco have been working on in response to the conversation that was happening um, while the round table was ongoing. And this artwork will be on display in the school um, following its completion. Vera and Marco, is there anything you'd like to say to your to what inspired you in particular? So interesting and uh, but it was really like um like a marathon almost, we were like, mm. and that uh, not done yet, but we catch up all the different words from you guys. And uh, we started by um, a little small uh, notes for us. And uh, of course, you can see like the main goal, like the main goal we were talking about right now is uh, 2050. And so we, the mount, yeah, it's like different aspects. Yeah, together. it's like a collage. It's a collage, and we didn't thought about or spend time to uh, to arrange it or something. We just just did it, kind of. Yeah. And it's now, a good response to what you were hearing, and that's amazing. Yeah. I like your angel wings on the on the light bulb of ideas. Electric traveling with the clever electricity, and uh, uh, also like like the feathers, the green traveling or go green, uh, the world. The world is like inside the mountains uh, and you know it's like very the glacier. Yeah, the glacier, the snow, traveling uh, is a big issue with uh, the, the, yeah, like the airplane and hotel and yeah, it's like a lot of details you can see probably better when you see it closer then and, and it's not done yet at the end we will you know match everything a little bit more together also yes. that's our goal <laughs> absolutely and we're going to start now to to like like doing a frame that holds everything together yeah. and wow. if you still continue talking uh what what's now now 5 30 yes time is running <laughs> <laughs> We let you get back to work. Thank you so much. That's, that's a, an amazing achievement in such a short time. My goodness, thank you. I'd yeah, like to thank it. all of the wonderful panelists. It's been a fascinating discussion. We've had lots of technical blips, but it didn't put us off. We got stuck in and uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.